Good afternoon and welcome again to the Veterans Forum. Uh, I'm Bob Stevens and I've had the pleasure and the honor of working with some of the guys and gals who served in, you name it, branches of the service in any war since 19 bumpy scratch, World War II and on right now. And we're offering and asking each and every one of you guys and gals if you have served anywhere and you would like to and can share your experiences with us, please. What we're saying and what we're doing is all part of a great mosaic that we're trying to do in cooperation with the Library of Congress's program to make sure that all of the histories are well documented, but more important, that each one of you and us who had a job to do, we did it. And that's part of this whole story, to make sure that nothing is overlooked. Some of the stories are weird, some are wonderful, and quite a few of them are just another way of some of the guys being able to unload stuff they've had for a long time. Uh, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I've been told many times that two or three of the people after the show, they were so much relieved because they now felt that they were free. Today we have another guy who did a lot of wonderful things. Dave is going to introduce himself and then we'll take it off from there. If you will, Dave, tell us your full name, spell your last name, your current address and your branch of service and your dates of service, if you will. Okay, my name is Dave Simmons, S-I-M-M-O-N-S. -M uh, I live in Lee and I've lived there all my life. Um, my branch of service was the U.S. Army from 1968 till 1970 and uh, I was in the infantry. Okay. Now, you said first air cavalry. Is there a difference between that and the other infantry, if you will? Well, yeah. So the first, people don't know these things. The, the first cavalry, well, a little history on the first cav. The seventh cav uh, was actually General George Custer's unit, which didn't make us feel so great. But, oh, uh, the yellow, <laughs> yellow ribbon guys. <laughs> but uh, it's an air mobile division, which uh, several other divisions in Vietnam were as well. Air mobile meaning you were transported by helicopter to the field, spent your time in the field, you were picked up and taken to a new place. So that's how we spent our, our time. Good. Now, we have some idea of who you are and what you are, but I'd like to go back and build a history so that people can, with you, share what you did so that we know how you came to be what you are today. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, where and when were you born and what was your life like as a child growing up? Okay, I was born in uh, April of 1947, actually at the, it was called the Pittsfield House of Mercy, I believe at the time, Pittsfield General, but I lived in Lee and uh, with my parents, my grandparents and my brother. I was brought up on a, uh, what was prior to my arrival was a, a Jersey dairy farm. And then when I was born, it was a John Deere farm dealership. Oh. And. Uh, in Lee? In Lee, yes, right on Turingham Road. Oh. And uh, I enjoyed life there very much. Well, enjoying what that, what did it constitute, if you will? Uh, Going through school, starting in school, junior high, high school, and so forth. What, I what kind of all, a life did you have that made it enjoyable? Yeah, uh, well, we had a lot of good times, but uh, you know, I was all public schools, obviously, uh, you know, Lee Grammar School, Lee High School, and uh, involved in. I wasn't much of an athlete, to be honest with you, but I was quite a musician. No. And uh, pursued that to some extent. I was a, a percussionist for several years, trained for six years, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I had a lot of a lot of good times in high school, especially in school bands, prom. I played. I played in the school band and the school dance band. I played in our own little rock band, if you will. On oh the yeah, side. we got to take a yeah. take a second here. I like to <laughs> kind of hold this up so that you can get a good look at it. This is back about the time of uh, Beatlemania, if you will. Yeah. Uh, we used to have uh, a lot of battles of the bands with local okay. other local bands. There we go. That's a good clean shot of my. There you go. Yeah. Now, looking at that, left to right, where are you? Are you the guy the I'm this guy with the Gibson guitar right here. Oh. This is my good friend, Tom Viner. Another good friend, uh, Ed Scoffro, who used to live in Pittsfield. Now he lives in Texas. And Bill Suff was killed in an automobile accident many years ago. Oh, that's not good. But we got some idea what you look like, OK? Now, uh, when you got through school, did you go to work? Go to no, originally I started uh, started uh, going uh, started college at UMass Amherst. I was there from uh, the fall of '65. My third semester, uh, fall of '66, I I dropped out, 
And uh, that set me up for something which we'll get to. But Oh, you uh, glinted when you said that. So <laughs> something coming down the pike. Uh, I then transferred to uh, Berks Community College and I graduated from there in the spring of 68. But of course, because I had dropped out of school, that made me eligible for the draft. And uh, in the spring of 68, I received my draft notice. Um, one of my professors tried to convince me to, he had a way that I could avoid that because I had an upcoming interview with uh, a representative from Colgate University and I told him no. I says, I've been drafted, I'm gonna do my time. Okay. So I went to the draft board. They had told me to report in September. I went down to the draft board. In fact, my aunt worked at the draft board and I told her, I have to go in, put me on the list to go as soon as possible. So that's what happened. Okay. Now, when you were talking before the show, uh, you indicated that there were four or five guys in front of you while you were going through the indoctrination oh. program. Fill them in on that. That's, there's always a little bit of a ha-ha someplace along well, the line. Now, now it's a ha-ha. Yeah. But uh, um, I had to go to Springfield to be uh, for the induction into the Army. And uh, I was sitting in this room, and we were all sitting on long seats, benches, whatever. And uh, four fellows sitting in front of me, the guy up in the front of the room points to those four. He says, "You four, you're in the Marine Corps." And I'm, oh. <laughs> Whoops! <laughs> you can't, you can't do that. Well, they can do anything they oh, like, yeah. especially in, in time of war. Wherever there's a need, they'll fill it somehow. But I did not get chosen for the Marine Corps. God bless the Marines, but I like the Army. Okay, yeah. all right. Then where did you report to when you from there when you were indoctrinated? Uh, what camp? Okay, How'd uh, you get in, there? Uh, we took a, a, a flight from uh, Springfield or excuse me, from Hereford, I believe, to uh, South Carolina, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And uh, I trained there for four months, 16 weeks. Wow. Mm -hmm. You was 13 or less when they were looking for you. <laughs> okay. What was your specialty when you get... Now, let's always... Each guy that has gone through boot, we all had the same stuff. But what was your impression when you went in as far as the transition from being a civilian to the Army and the way the Army wanted you to behave and do and so well, forth? Well, I, I think the, the first day is always, well, it's unnerving because you're being indoctrinated immediately. They're all over you, you know. They're, they, they need to have you start thinking their way. Mm -hmm. And uh, most people aren't used to that. And it's intimidating. And I know with the, get off the uh, bus and they hand us all this stuff with the rolled up mattresses and I'm trying to get the mattress up there. And I, of course I was too slow so they made everybody in the barracks do push-ups and I'm thinking this is a great way to start. Yeah, however, you're the cause of it. However, we all got along. Okay. Nobody held it against me because they had their turns too. Okay. So. Anything special, uh, the, the usual questions, like any particular DI that you remembered or did you didn't like or couldn't get along with or made your life better? What was it like? I can honestly say this. I, I can't think of anyone in particular I didn't get along with. Uh, I had, you know, a couple of closer friends in, in basic training and AIT. Uh, I found that most people got along very well, and there was, there was quite a mixture of backgrounds, a wide diversity of backgrounds, many different races and religions oh, yeah. and you know different sized people you know we're not totally uniform when it comes to size I no, was one of the, one size I was one of the smaller guys <laughs> yeah <laughs> so. oh now uh, one, one of the things you guys like to talk about it was always the other guy when you're getting your first set of shots if you will how were you treated you bounce from one to the other to a basically line? yeah they, they would I, I think it was relatively new at the time but they had the the new pressure guns where they just oh, oh the kind that instead didn't of hurt. a needle they, yeah they, they don't hurt they just leave a, a golf ball on your arm for about three days yeah and then push ups all day long <laughs> after work it out yep now what would, when did you get through basic and if you will uh, did you apply for any particular specialty or no, were you they, they just selected as a for number? Me. Okay. Uh, we had eight weeks of basic training, which is obviously, you know, physical training, uh, a lot of uniform code of military justice. You've got a lot of firing qualifications, things of that nature, uh, bivouac type stuff. And after that, uh, I was just assigned to advanced infantry training. That was another eight weeks. And uh, there you learn a lot more about weaponry and things of that sort. So, to some extent, uh, simulated jungle warfare, but it's nothing like the real thing. Can't oh, be. No, nothing at all. No. 
What were you trained in as far as arms, small arms? Uh, small arms uh, in, in basic training, uh, I qualified as a shot expert, as a matter of fact, with the M14. We also shot the uh, M60 uh, 30 caliber machine gun, uh, light anti-tank weapon, uh, what, grenades. Bazooka? I'm sorry? Gazoo bazookas? Well, they're like a, a disposable bazooka. It's a little canister type thing. You expand it. It's very light. probably weighs maybe three, four pounds. Okay. Shoot it once. It's got a pop-up sight. Shoot it once. Throw it away. Deep six? Huh? Yep. Wow. So we, we, got, uh, we even shot the 50 caliber machine gun, but that's a beast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I just trained with that. I never used it after. Well, you never know. Um, now, also down here, you identified yourself as being uh, uh, communication. Now, that would be additional training. Where and when did you have that? Actually, uh, it was on-the-job training. Uh, I started off in Vietnam as a, as a rifleman, as a regular uh, squad member, uh, point man, which okay. nobody really cared much to do. But, you're the IOF. You know, it's, uh, you're new. You're going to serve your turn doing it. So. Oh, yeah. But you... Uh, it, it was quite an experience. Uh, after, oh, I want to say three or four months, I had noticed, uh, you know, I, I thought I'd be interested in carrying a radio for the platoon. And uh, so the opportunity came up and I, I took it. It gave me a, a chance to get out of being in the very front of the line. Not that that was always the worst place to be because it didn't really matter, but psychologically you didn't like yeah. being first in line. But, uh, so I continued on uh, as a radio operator for my lieutenant. I think it was uh, Lieutenant uh, Martin Biggie at the time uh, for a couple of months, two, three months. And uh, then in one particular firefight we were in, the captain's, one of his two radio operators was seriously wounded and I ended up uh, taking one of the radio operator jobs for him. Cool. There was two of us. Can I back up a bit? You, sure. you hopscop and you yeah. years, yeah. if you will. When did you leave the states? Oh, I left. So the, we know I left some the states idea in December, you got early December of '69. Okay, '68. I'm sorry, '68. Right. And uh, I left from Fort Lewis, Washington, on a commercial jet. And uh, it's a very long flight, if I recall. It's like 22 hours. We stopped once to refuel, and uh, landed in Cameron Bay in Vietnam. And they open the doors, and you walk into a blast furnace because the temperature there is like. I love hot weather, but I'd never experienced anything like this. Prelude to Hades. Oh, my goodness. Hot, hot, hot. And humid. Oh, very, very humid. Yeah. Very humid. Okay. What was your reception there? When you, uh, when you, when you know, you a couple of days of orientation, you know, paperwork, obviously, uh, getting <laughs> assigned some basic gear. And then I was assigned to the 1st Cavalry Air Mobile. The first air, we call it the 1st Air Cav. It's officially the 1st Cavalry Division Air Mobile and uh, flown up to the Central Highlands of, v of Vietnam and had a two or three day uh, training camp. Uh, and from there we were deployed to our units. Okay, now in were, you, were you in the, in the bush, if you will, or were you on a, a helicopter crew? Oh no, I was, I was in the bush. Um, I was assigned to, uh, to uh, I think the first landing zone I went to was called Landing zone Andy. It was in a landing zone or a fire base is really it, it, it's nothing fancy, but it's a, it's a larger perimeter with concertina wire around the outside, mm -hmm. bunkers, a command post, and then the battery of artillery. That was your fire support in the field. Your primary fire support was the artillery, and uh, I was assigned there. And uh, and from there we'd be shuttled out uh, six helicopters at a time till the whole company was out in the field and to go out and make contact with the enemy. That was our job. Okay, and you point man at all times? Oh, no, 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 no. That was occasional, not all the time. No. It was kind of like, it's your turn. Okay. <laughs> nobody wanted it full time. Well, it, nobody volunteered too often. Not no, too often. What I like don't to, recall many people volunteering. You showed but. me a uh, map here. I'd like to take a little different attack because mm -hmm. not very often do we have, if you will, documentation. A friend of mine sent me that this okay. summer. Okay, I'd uh, like, if you will, Kind of walk us through some of the areas you would. Okay, well, this is, this is part we'll of the Central it. Highlands of Vietnam. You have your delta down below, which is the Mekong Delta, and then further up toward the center of uh, Vietnam. It's all it's mountainous, not huge mountains, but there's literally hundreds of mountains. They're all numbered. Oh. And uh, 
These are the, the fire support bases I've highlighted in yellow or some of the ones I was stationed at when I was not in the field. Uh, we'd be out in the field for, oh, maybe anywhere from two weeks to three weeks, three and a half weeks, and then we'd be lifted back for uh, what we called a break uh, to go back and pull perimeter guard at the fire base. Oh, something different. Yeah, something different. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. What was your reaction with respect to, that's the word, interfacing with the uh, natives? We didn't have a lot of interaction with natives. We, uh, we worked a lot with, with people called the Mountain Yards. The Mountain Yards were Vietnamese, but they're like a combination of French Vietnamese. There's a lot of French influence in Vietnam. And uh, they were, Mountain Yards I believe would be called mountain people, but they knew the terrain very well. And uh, they lived in the mountains primarily, but we used some of them occasionally as what they call the Kit Carson Scouts. Uh, we would have one assigned to us, and, uh, he would help us navigate. He knew the countryside very, very well, and they, they were a big asset to us. Did a lot of it's, penny saving. Oh, yeah. Now, as far as uh, normal civilian contact, for our particular unit, it was very, very rare. We might occasionally come upon a village, but we, that, was, that was not common. We, we were pretty much to ourselves most of the time. Okay. Any particular shall we say, incidents that you remember that uh, stand out as far as your experience going in and out sometimes, just uh, well, good, bad, or otherwise? Well, yeah, I mean, as far as our, our combat assaults, for yeah. example. So people get appreciation of what, yeah, what uh, really went on. What a combat assault is, again, is that basically they lift you to a, some strategic point in the field, uh, which has been already prepped with a lot of artillery. And then when you're going in on your, your, your Huey helicopters, they're accompanied by Cobra gunships, and they're basically just trying to clear the area. Mm -hmm. And your hope always was that it was what they call a green LZ, which means it was there was no activity there. There was nobody waiting. It wasn't hot. It wasn't a hot LZ, right. Hot LZs are what we didn't want to see. And we didn't see them often, believe me. And when we did, uh, we didn't get met by a battalion or a regiment. It was usually a smaller force. They might get incoming mortars on us. And, uh, but when you, they told you to get off that chopper, you got off very fast. Muy pronto. They didn't want to sit there hovering uh, because uh, they're zeroing in yeah. on that chopper yeah. all the time. So. And uh, my first, first drop off of the helicopter, of course I was nervous, I was, didn't know what to expect. And so uh, the chopper's coming in. And we're above what they call elephant grass. Elephant grass is mm, yeah, I know. You five can't feet see tall. Two feet anyway. in front of you. So I, you know, and I knew they wanted me to get off fast. So I thought we were right, right near the ground. So I step off, and I had about another six feet to go. <laughs> <laughs> Slow gainer. <laughs> it didn't happen again, but uh, it was different. Okay. One of the guys was saying uh, the first, one of his first trips uh, that you don't sit inside; you just sit along the the oh, edge. Yeah. Well, I, I'm terrified of heights. I've, I've never liked heights. But on that chopper, I would sit in the doorway or stand on the skids, yeah. and it didn't bother me at all. Yeah. But they said one of the, for the, the first timers would get a little bit of a pat. Oh, yeah. You and could, before you know, you know whoops, <laughs> yeah. white knuckle all the yeah. rest of the day. <laughs> now, uh, we've always talked about the combat medics mm -hmm. and the the mobile units. Do you have any experiences with them as far as how they treated you? Because I see you've got a purple pump up there. What, when mm -hmm. and how did you get that? I got that at, at Landing Zone Andy, I believe. It was uh, January 26th of 69. I, w I was at the, the base camp, and uh, we were, it was probably, well, it was late at night, 10, 11 o'clock at night, dark. And of course, uh, we, there were trip flares and things, alarming, alarm oh, yeah. type things out in front of the perimeter. And I could have sworn I had heard something. And uh, so I took and manually threw a trip flare out. And when I did, I saw movement. I saw people moving. So I start shooting. And I, I guarantee you, I probably wasn't even close. But uh, that just opened up all kinds of firepower. So you opened Pandora's box then? I did, but somebody had to. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, this went on for, for a while. There, it was very common to, uh, they, they called the, the enemy, these particular enemy sappers. They were trying to come through the wire, mm -hmm. trying to penetrate the perimeter. 
and uh, you know the dearmament that we had was was ungodly. I mean, that's the stuff you really don't you, you can't appreciate it till you see it. And you know, we, we had what they call uh, foo gas. Foo gas is napalm in a barrel, and it's planted in the ground, and it's used when people when you try to defend yourself. It's detonated. Uh, they had what they call beehive rounds. You take your heart, uh, your 105 howitzers, your artillery howitzers, which normally shoot a high explosive round, mm -hmm. and you level them, and you use a round that's full of little flechettes. They're little darts, about the thousands of them, and they're shot through the wire. Shrapnel all it's, over uh, the place. It's uh, not good. Not good. Mm. But somewhere in the whole thing, I felt a slam to my face, and I remember I had a mustache at the time, and I. Oh, I thought, I thought my lip was blown apart, and I finally said to the guy with me, I says, my lip already says, that's your mustache, you know, but of course I was terrified. I was lucky. It, uh, it hit below the eye, not in the eye, and I was lucky. I had a swollen face for a couple of days. And you shook it off, you know. You don't have much choice. I know. Yeah. No. But you made the best of it, though. Oh, yeah. Okay. What else can you share with us you'd like to talk about? Um, not, not the gory stuff, whatever you feel, this is your show. Uh, let's see. Things you want to share with the people so the guys may be coming after us. Yeah, yeah. They have some uh, idea what's going on. Some people would, would ask me, some, did you ever, do you remember anything funny? And uh, my answer to that was, well, not really much, but there's one incident that I covered with both uh, Captain Holland Beck, my oh. prior company commander. I'll hold him up. And this fellow here, Mike Billiou, my Buddy RTO, we were whoop, whoop, he and you're, I. You're ahead of the game. We got to oh. get a good camera shot. Oh, here. I'm sorry. Okay, there we go. Ne again, if you will, your lieutenant. Yeah, uh, the, he was cap uh, captain, Captain Ralph Hollenbeck, and uh, this fellow here was my uh, my uh, companion radio operator. We both worked for Captain Hollenbeck for several months, and uh, uh, as as his as his radio operator. And what what happened was this year I been in contact with both of these fellows. So I reminded them of the only funny story I could think of. Uh, it was the beginning of the monsoon season, and of course we carried so much stuff, it was, it's hard to describe how much stuff you carried on you. But in addition to that, they, uh, they issued us uh, air mattresses. So, yeah. Really. Okay, excuse me. Right. <laughs> it's so, uh, a different war. So Mike says, oh, I don't need this thing. So somehow he got rid of it. Uh, but Captain Hollenbeck and I kept ours, so we set up uh, one particular night. It was starting to rain a little bit, not really hard, but we set up, we took our ponchos and made a makeshift tent out of it. And the captain and I both blew up our air mattresses and we're, we're bedding down for the night. Mike is laying between us, he's on the ground. I think it was around two o'clock in the morning, we woke up and we heard the splashing sound. And it was Mike flailing around in a big puddle of water. <laughs> so the next day, Captain Hollenbeck got him a replacement air mattress. So. But that's you. probably about one of the only funny things I remember from Vietnam. But I reminded them of that, so. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to figure what uh, the best way to do it. I'd, I'd like to, if you will, digress for a bit. Mm -hmm. And I would like you to talk a little bit about that guy. That guy's my father. Uh, he was a, a, a technical sergeant in uh, the U.S. Army in the Philippines. Uh, back in World War II, and uh, I actually have a, I didn't bring it, but I do have a hand sketch of a similar picture that uh, a friend of his, Jesus, I forget his last name, actually drew of him in the Philippines, oh. and it uh, hangs on the wall at home. Any other relatives in the my, my Army, Navy, Marines, Corps? Uh, yeah, my, my brother uh, is uh, three, three and a half years older than I, he was in the reserves, and uh, he did not get deployed. He was expecting to get deployed, but it didn't happen for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And my uncle Fred uh, was in the Marine Corps in, in uh, Korea. He was a mortar, mortar operator. So that's our military background. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not too shabby, if I gosh. Now, <clears throat> being a radio man, you were almost the shadow, if you will, of your captain or lieutenant, oh, yeah. whichever. With him 
Any good stories about that, about how close you had to when you were a firefighter, how he would use you to make sure everybody else was safe? A That's, lot, a like lot of the communication about. would come from the radio operators, obviously, but we also had to be right by his side because very often he would just grab our handset and he'd do all the talking. But, uh, you know, either he or, or ourselves, or we'd have to call, uh, we'd have to communicate with the Air Force to bring in fighters, uh, communicate with the artillery at night to bring in protective uh, artillery fire around your perimeter, which you had to bring in very, very close sometimes. Oh, yeah. Very you close. You count the revolution. There used, to be a, there used to be some unwritten rule that in artillery school, I, I never went to artillery school, but you, you couldn't explode rounds within, I think, 200 meters. <laughs> no, it no. doesn't work that way. You come in a lot closer. Every night we had to dig a foxhole, every night. And just walk them in as they come down. And, and what you do is, at night when they when you call in those, you, you get they they fire marking rounds, and then you have them fire for effect, and they start firing the large uh, guns, and that uh, shrapnel is buzzing over your head, I literally cut down trees. It's that powerful. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you're you get your head below ground level. Any real gory? Events, if you will. I'm not out for blood and guts. No, no. And I, you guys had a completely different war. It was very different, and it was uh, it wasn't constant contact. There was no front lines to speak of. It was contact usually in the jungle. Most of the time, you never saw the enemy. You you would be sniped for, by a sniper in a tree. You would meet opposition, which you couldn't see, but they'd start firing at you. Uh, it was it was not common to see the enemy, which almost made it seem kind of surreal. Well, I'd like to bring a question up, and you see a lot of these movies they did of the Nam and some of the booby traps and so forth. Were you ever exposed to that, or was that strictly Oh, Hollywood? booby traps were a very real thing. I mean, we lost several people from booby traps. Uh, I think a lot of the movies get a little bit carried away. They, they, they're a little theatrical sometimes. They present pictures of things that really didn't happen. Um, when I think of the movie Platoon, I don't know if you've seen the movie Platoon, oh, yeah. but, but there's a little story on the side with the sergeant and the other uh, as antagonists. We didn't experience that. Uh, another thing we didn't experience, see, Vietnam got a, a reputation by a lot of citizens that when the, the My Lai incident occurred, oh, yeah. uh, Lieutenant Cali, where they went in and wiped out a, a village, I think people got the mistaken impression that there was a lot of that going on. That didn't go on. No. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's th so those things paper. grow over time. Oh, you know? I know. And the longer the distance, mm -hmm. the, the, yeah. the more heroics they have. Now, talking about mobile, did any of the guys have to be uh, tunnel rats? Actually, I remember a couple times, uh, it was, yeah, I want to say maybe two times that uh, I saw a person actually go into a tunnel. That, that was not something we did on a regular basis either. Uh, we happened to be in areas, I guess, where there weren't a lot of tunnels, so that was fine. But, you know, I was small, but I wasn't quite small enough, thanks. And you're big enough to think you didn't want to do it to begin I with. I think it was voluntary, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, we, again, we didn't have much of that. I'd like if you will to give us a little bit of the story here about your book and okay, this, the importance this, this of it. This book, uh, was written by uh, Lieutenant Colonel at the time, Hal Moore, and uh, 1965. Let me hold it up. Yeah, in 1965, the first cavalry uh, became the first cavalry division air mobile. So they were the the I guess you would call them the pioneers in Vietnam. Uh, they, they made their debut in Vietnam in 1965 at Ashaw Valley, and that was one of the most fierce battles, one of the most bloody battles of the Vietnam War. The others might be uh, the Battle of Ripcord in 1971 as we were withdrawing from Vietnam or Hamburger Hill or some of these others. Mm -hmm. but this is very significant and uh, I've read the book obviously. And I've watched the movie, the Mel Gibson adaptation, it's called We Were Soldiers. This is We Were Soldiers Once and Young and the movie is We Were Soldiers. But it's a very, very accurate description of of the 1st Cavalry in Vietnam. I, I think it was very accurate. Now, were you in during the Tet Offensive? The Tet Offensive uh, was in January, February timeframe of 68. 
Uh, so I was a little bit late for that, several months late. And from all the accounts of the people who had been there, I'm just as glad I had missed yeah, it. Better late than never. <laughs> there was a slight resurgence a year later, in the anniversary of the Tet, but it was nothing like the Tet Offensive. Okay. How about your beanie, your old buddy well, this right This is here. My, my, my original boonie hat, uh, which obviously, it, you know, it really doesn't look that worn because we didn't wear them very often. Uh, in the field, you'd, our unit never wore these in the field. You wore your steel pot. Yeah. And these were rolled up in your, in your backpack. Uh, the only time I'd wear these is back at a base camp or whenever you were a little more secure, but they don't give you any protection. But I gave this to my brother when I came home and I borrowed it for today. So it's, oh, so so it's, it's it. a real memento, if you will. Oh, it, it really is. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, now, I'm going to change gears a little bit. I don't want to put you on the spot, but no. also on the board, they have a little bronze star. Would you show us, tell us about that? Please? Okay, well, now there's two ways of getting a bronze star. This is for merit, it's not for valor. Uh, if you got it for valor, obviously, it's because of some particular act. Mm -hmm. uh, the one for, for, for merit is not you for valor. <laughs> just happened to be there and somebody well, did yeah, it. Well, yeah, I mean. Uh, well, but you don't get them for free. Somehow you qualify for it. I yeah. don't know the exact qualification except it's for meritorious service. And, okay. Uh, so it's a. Uh, but it all adds up. The well, yeah, it does. And, and it, the, the nice thing about that is you can get a free uh, registration and number plate. In Massachusetts? Yes, in Purple Heart as well, yeah. By God, I didn't think the state had anything for free. One of the Sorry, only things, Governor. One of the only things I know that's free. Okay, well, great. Now, somewhere along the line, we were talking earlier, you were married, you said a couple of times, but uh, this was after your service, right? Oh, yeah, I, I got married a, a, a year after I got okay. my service. Now, this is a very crucial point in my book. When you finally were told you're going to be discharged, Mm -hmm. What was your reaction? How you felt? And then when you came home, how did you feel with the reception that you got? Okay, uh, when was I told I was going to be discharged? Well, that was one of the, I guess, advantages of the Vietnam era war, that when you were deployed, you were deployed for a very specific time, one year. So I knew when I was coming home. And uh, you had the opportunity to stay an extra month if you wanted, and then you didn't have to fulfill your last six month duty stateside. Uh -huh. But I told them, no, thank you, I'm going I'll take home, the six. and I'll take my six-month yeah. stateside, which is what I did. So uh, I, I knew all along I was going to get out in uh, July of 1970. Uh, and what happened when you got home, when you landed and when you well, got here? Okay. Uh, That's the part. It, it's the, not good, but I... No, it, it's not that people, I don't think, intentionally acted this way, and it wasn't everyone, but there was a... A very general feeling in the population, I think that, first of all, the Vietnam War was extremely unpopular. And the longer it went on, the more unpopular it became. And I said there were some misconceptions about what we did, why we were there. But you didn't have this cool, it was a cool reception when you came back. I, I recall very, very clearly when I, I, I landed in California, took a commercial flight from there to uh, Bradley Field in Connecticut. And, you know, a couple of, one changeover. But the people in the airport, some of them would just look at you disapprovingly. Yeah, but you were in uniform where you landed. Oh, I was class A uniform, oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, some people, you could tell the, it was a look of disapproval. And it just made you feel uncomfortable. So when I landed in uh, Hartford, my family was there, my mother, father, uh, brother, sister-in-law, whatever. And I met them at the gate, and I said, uh, just give me a couple minutes, and I went in to the men's room and changed in civilian clothes immediately. And okay. uh, I just passage, wanted, to, uh, yeah. wanted to get out of it. I'm going to say this for the last, because I think it's, okay. that's, if that's you fine. will. But now, when you were discharged, uh, did you join any outfits like the American Legion, <laughs> DAB, or what have you? See, I, it takes me a long time to make up my mind. Oh. Uh, several years I'll ago, wait. I, uh -huh. I'll wait. <laughs> several years ago, I did join the uh, American Legion, but I, I only, I only signed up for one year. Now, this September of this year, I finally joined the Veterans Foreign War, and uh, I've only been to two meetings. I've had people ask me over the years to join, and I just never did it. Okay, it's your choice. 
But I told Aldo Pascucci, the, the commander of the post, I said, I, I had to think about it for a while first. So I, I waited 40 years. Well, you don't want to rush out because no, I didn't want to you'll buy your gold if you got any. <laughs> no. Were you then married or did you get married after the service? Okay, uh, I was married in 1971, a year after I got out of the service. And I, my first marriage was uh, for 11 years. I have a daughter and a son. Uh, my daughter lives locally in West Ackridge and my son lives in uh, New Haven. And uh, then we did divorce. And uh, then two years later, I married my current wife and I have a stepson. He lives in Pittsfield. And. Uh, oh, good. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now. Oh, that little doodad. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a, friend of mine, a friend of mine oh. and Lee, uh, that I've known my entire life, uh, came up to me one day this, this summer and he said, uh, I remembered you were in the first cab. I said, yeah. And he said, well, you know, I picked this up at a, uh, a yard sale. And I said, well, what is it? He said, it's a first, cav first cavalry calling oh, card. Yeah. And I was kind of aware of what calling cards were, even though I had never used one, but I had never seen uh, this particular one that's got my first cab unit on it. And uh, the, what these were used for, and it's a, a bit more a morbid, I guess you could say, but uh, after you had uh, uh, a fire contact, fight. a firefight with the enemy, enemy casualties are there, and this was supposedly placed on the forehead. And that's why I say it sounds morbid, but that's part of the psychological yeah. warfare, and it's meant as a deterrent. It's meant to discourage them. Uh, you know, propaganda pamphlets are another way, but I guess this would be considered pretty Nine effective. Nine millimeter slug is another way, too. Yeah, and, yeah it's that, quite another that's way, yeah. the ultimate. Oh, dear. Well, you've been in, you're home. What do you do for a living from there on out? Okay, I'm being uh, nosy, but okay, yeah, it tells uh, out the story. Uh, about, uh, when I got out of the Army in July of uh, 70, I think I drew unemployment for four days. Oh, 52, 20? I was, I was, you know, they said you can draw it for a year, so I, I signed up for it and I, I didn't even last the week and I ended up getting a job at uh, Kimberly Clark and Lee Schweitzer Paper Mills, if you will. And I took a job there as a janitor. I wanted a day job so I could go to night school, which I did for a while. GI Bill? Actually, the only time I used the GI Bill was for an electronics course I took from the Bell and Howell schools. Oh. And uh, I got through building all my equipment and my television, and that's as far as I ever went with electronics, but. <laughs> okay, then what? Uh, then uh, a after serving, working as a janitor for a couple of years, I, then I worked part-time in a shipping department, then I uh, was offered a job uh, as a foreman in the uh, slitter department for slitting, finishing paper. And after, I think, four years of that, uh, I actually ended up going into the finance department and the inventory control department. And I went back to, to night school and uh, for three years and I got my bachelor's degree from uh, Westfield State College, got a degree in finance. And uh, then shortly before I got my degree, uh, I was promoted to cost analyst and from there I became a cost accounting coordinator or manager, if you will. Good. And I was there in that capacity t till 2002. And then you retired? Or I retired early. I retired okay. early, yes. We, we used to work an awful lot of hours. And uh, my wife and I had decided that uh, if we played our cards right, and of course the way they offered their pension, you could, you could take an inflated pension. They call it level funding. Oh, and, that's uh, a new term to what, me. What, what does they did that mean? It gave you the ability to leave at 55 with a higher pension, which would stay higher until you qualify for Social Security. So it was, it was a way to make it work. And I've been working part-time ever since. Sound I like a, a buyout. I work at Carberry Auto Parts now. And huh? I, so you've been keeping busy? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Oh, you got so damn many questions. What I'd like to do, we've got a few minutes left, mm -hmm. about 20 according to that clock on the wall. Mm -hmm. I'd like you to run us through your fruit salad, if you will, to explain what your different metals and so forth are. Most, uh, that blue guy on the top, what okay. it took and how Th you got this it. This is the one that all infantrymen, uh, I guess you might say covet, but yeah. it's called the combat infantryman's badge. Okay, we're gonna get a picture on that, and if okay. you will, mm -hmm. that'll be up real close. Norm yeah. is a cracker jacket, mm -hmm. this sort of stuff. There you go. Thank you, Norm. 
Okay, Walk us through starting yeah, the, on the, the left-hand right, side. Oh, the left-hand side, okay. Uh, this is actually set up similar to a uniform, yeah. uh, with this being the right sleeve and this the left sleeve. Well, uh, when I left the Army, my current uh, division was the first armored division okay. down in Texas, Fort Hood, Texas. And my prior division was the first cavalry in Vietnam. That was mm -hmm. where I served. Uh, again, this is the combat infantryman's badge. You had to be an infantry, uh, MOS they called it, military, military occupational status. And, and what were the requirements so people will get some idea The requirement what really was uh, basically the name of the badge, combat infantry experience. Yeah, for how long? I was, uh, I'm not exactly sure, but I had nine months in the field, so it was obviously enough. Mm -hmm. I think it was, I, I think most awards, like, uh, I think the uh, the Air Medal, I think it was, it was six months. It had to be at least six in, months. In, in, in the country? Oh, uh, well, in, I think, in, well, actually, in, in that, in the Air, air yeah. Division, right. Yeah. But, uh, and we, again, that's the Bronze Star, Purple Heart, Air Medal for Combat Assaults. This is Good Conduct Medal. Oh, come on. What? Good conduct. I, I was I a good. Know. I was a good boy. <laughs> Never got caught. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> the next one down here is National Defense. Yeah, that's United States, obviously. This is a U.S. issued medal. It's it's for Vietnam service. Okay, with two stars. Uh, with two stars, and I I don't even really know what the what the two stars on that exactly okay. stand for. Okay, join the club. Uh, this is called the um, Vietnamese Gallantry Cross. That's issued by by Vietnam, mm -hmm. and this is Vietnam Campaign Ribbon. So these last two are issued by Vietnam. Uh, these are my, my rank stripes. I was a sergeant, E5, a buck sergeant, if you will. Uh, this unit on the right is my uh, expert qualification with the M14. Okay. Did you want any extra pay for that when you qualified expert? No. Okay. No, the only extra pay I ever drew was if you're in a combat zone, I think you got $65 a month extra. Yippee. I think it was 65 but. Okay. And you didn't pay taxes either for the year. Wow. All these perks. Yeah, well, all the perks, you yeah. should have get right in the front line all the time. Uh, Way this back the, to Sabres, huh? This, this here is called the Gary Owen Crest. Now, the Gary Owen unit was the 7th Cavalry. That was, yeah. that was the uh, uh, General Custer unit. Mm -hmm. okay. And over here, that's the 7th Cavalry. Fifth Battalion. I was in the Fifth Battalion. Okay. This I got from the Fifth, uh, the Fifth Battalion Seventh Cav Association. I got that this summer. Good. And this is just nothing more than a name tag. Yeah. Name and dates of service. Pretty, it, it's a pretty good square piece of what mm. life was all about for you. Well, it's something that I can leave for as a legacy, I guess. Oh yeah. Mm. Now talk about leaving and legacies. With all that you've seen and done, where you've been. What's happened? What's your opinion? Was that positive or negative as to how you've lived your life since? Uh, some people think I'm crazy, but I have to say it's positive. No, don't think uh, it's your it's your life. You know. I it. mean, obviously, it's n virtually none of the people I served with wanted to be there. But uh, for a couple of reasons, it's positive. First, it gave you a sense of duty. Uh, you know, I, I'm a very firm believer in. You know, this country does provide a lot for us. It gives us oh, a yeah, lot. Oh yeah. And I, and I believe that when you're called to pay back, it's your duty to do oh, yeah. that. And I've always felt good about serving. Yeah. Uh, but the other thing is uh, it gives you a, a much different appreciation of life, if you will. You know, the, the sanctity of life, yeah. how and precious how it really it is. And the other thing that it also lets you see is how the other half of the world lives. And believe me, we live extremely well. I'm sure you know this. Yeah. We live extremely well compared to many, many people. Yeah, the guy had outfit used to say, we live high on the hog. We really do. In, oh. in our worst times, we live very high on yeah. the hog. And, uh, but, you know, we had a luxury of, like I said, we, we knew we were going to be there a year. These people, it was in their backyard. It could be their entire lifetime. Yeah. Well, they've been subjected to it from the French. Oh, the French were there for years before years us. Before they tried to liberate them and instruct mm -hmm. them and help them. Yeah. That's bad news. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything well, more you'd like to add, sir? Any words of encouragement or your opinion right now? Of to well, I would what's say going that I, I'm still a very large supporter of the military. Uh, I think it's uh, necessary. And I, I really believe, I truly believe that most military people 
They're, they don't like war any better than yeah. I did. But uh, I believe in, in serving your country. I believe in defending your country. You can't afford, in my opinion, not to have a military. Uh, it's one of those, well, I won't call it an evil. It's necessary. Okay. It's it may necessary. not be politically correct, but it, it's something that is Oh, I'm sure a lot of people, doing. it's not politically correct. So, I know. Well, we've got about seven minutes, eight minutes. I'm supposed to drag this out, but okay. I won't try to drag it out. What I'd like to do, if you will, do you have any stories about your dad, for example, to kind of wrap up the history? Well, of what's, okay. What's my, going my, on? my father, he was not he was not a combat soldier. He was in a combat area, but he was actually a cook. Oh, good. Okay. You need him. And well, that's my point. It, you know, when people talk about serving, well. You serve where you're needed, yeah. and you need it everywhere. You need to have cooks, you need to have medics, you need to have uh, nurses and doctors, you need uh, artillery people, you need truck drivers, you need it's administrative, you need clerks. Yeah. They're, they're all the same thing. It's the luck of the draw. You, you know, I didn't choose where I went. I know. Well, what's one of the themes, if you will, of our appeal to the people out here? Uh, the bottom line, each one of us, had a job to do, mm -hmm. and with few exceptions, we did it. Right. Everybody wasn't Audie Murphy or Joe oh, no, Foss, no. but again, the guy up the point needed support, mm -hmm. and every one of us was something on that little you know, it, it, road it's, it's a system that works. Yeah. It's not perfect. No. But it does work. Yeah. And the best part, in spite of it all, there are always uh, some real good memories about it. You meet some weird people, you meet some wonderful oh, people. I met some people. Now, have you kept in touch with a lot of the guys? Uh, again, you know, it's like waiting 40 years to, to join the VFW until I was contacted by the uh, 5th Battalion, 7th Cav and got those addresses this summer. I had never been in contact been an orphan with, since? with one person. I had wow. not been in contact with one. But have that opened anything up for you now, having more people to contact? Actually, yeah. Is it a good uh, feeling? It, it's a very good feeling. Uh, I, actually, I have one guy in particular that I communicate with on Facebook. I'm, I have a lot of Facebook friends that are veterans, you know, so mm -hmm. we, we discuss a lot. But they're not all people I know, just people who had similar experiences. Okay. But, but you can talk the same language. You oh, know yeah, that. You yeah. don't have to have an in, in, oh, no, introduction. Oh, no, we know exactly. We you all know, know exactly what the other's exactly talking about. Exactly right. But uh, it was very nice to, to, to make contact with, with these, these people in particular because I spent a lot of time with them. Oh, yeah. and, and you look back and you say, well, why when you left, why didn't you walk away with their address? Mm -hmm. But we didn't. And, and I'll, I'll tell you one more story. That when we left Vietnam, supposedly it was a tradition that when the flight lifted off, the commercial jetliner lifted off, that the, the plane would burst into applause and cheers. No. So I'm on the plane, and the plane takes off, and it's dead silent. And uh, the captain come over the radio. He says, hey, uh, what's the problem here? He says, aren't you guys in a good mood? And I don't know what it was. I think people were just, just exhausted. Yeah, pooped. They just wanted to get out. <laughs> yeah. But that was anticlimactic. Nothing happened. We just rode home. But you're going home. Oh, yeah. That's the good part. That was the good part. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. My friend, as they mm. say in Swedish, that's a wrap. Thank you. And all I can do is say thank you. Oops. Oh. Don't do any of your family. Welcome home, buddy. Well, thank you, Bob. I appreciate it. Good deal. Now, you're going to be a recruiter for my program. You don't know it yet. but you Oh, I didn't be. know that? No, oh, yeah. I did not that, know that. That's the fringe benefit I get. No, oh, certainly. fringe okay. benefit. That's about, as they call it, a wrap, folks. What I'd like to do, again, I probably worn this one thin, but to each and every one of you guys and gals, particularly the nurses and the wax and the ways, the women, the strangest thing I've ever had so far is to try to find women, service gals, who will talk. Every one of you, for some reason, refuses or doesn't want to. I can't force you, but what you did must be recorded and cannot be lost. The bottom line is, I've said many times, if you don't tell your story, Nobody else will. And we can't really, in all candor, miss that part of our history because every one of us is part of that whole. No matter what we did or how we did it, it all has to be added up. So again, if you will, check the address. Come and see us. We'll be in your debt. 
and we'll make sure that you feel welcomed. Bob Stevens again saying thank you. We hope this has been interesting to you. Come and see us. Good night.